Let me um, begin this evening's proceedings. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Policy Exchange this evening. If we've not met, my name is Richard Eakins. I teach law at Oxford and I, uh, I lead Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project with uh, my colleague, Dan G. We're meeting this evening, of course, to discuss Sir Noel Malcolm's uh, book, Human Rights and Political Wrongs, which I'm happy to brandish here. And of course, uh, some of you will have seen it and read it, and it's available on, on our website for you to, to download and read in full. Uh, the book, as you will have seen, gives the idea of human rights, the practice of human rights law, the close attention that they deserve. And it's an important and timely contribution to public thinking about how we are governed in this country. I'm very grateful to Sir Noel for having written it, and it's our pleasure to have um, been able to help uh, bring it into uh, publication and to bring this meeting together to discuss its argument. I should say that neither the book nor this meeting would have been possible without the energy, enthusiasm, efficiency of Dean Wilson and Julian Mizzen. It's been my pleasure to thank them for all their support throughout. Well, let me turn now to introduce our speakers this evening. Sir Noel, on my right, is the eminent historian of ideas, uh, senior research fellow at All Souls College in Oxford, known in particular for his work on Thomas Hobbes. And in addition to his many academic accolades and achievements, he has also had a remarkable career in political journalism. Uh, Baroness O'Neill, on my left, eminent philosopher, recipient of the Holberg Prize in 2017, former Reef lecturer, served for many years as the chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Lord Phillips, a very distinguished former judge, who served as Master of the Rolls, before Chief Justice of England and Wales, the last ever senior lord, and the <coughs> inaugural president of the UK Supreme Court. And Professor Finnis, uh, who is one of the world's leading legal philosophers and constitutional law scholars, author of many works, including uh, the well-known uh, Natural Law and Natural Rights. So our, our proceedings this evening, Sir Noel will introduce his work um, for a, uh, a period, and then I'll invite Baroness O'Neill, Lord Phillips, and Professor Finnis to comment briefly, before giving Sir Noel uh, an opportunity to, to say a few words in response, uh, after which we will uh, open it up for a wider discussion. So Sir Noel, over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, I must begin just by thanking Policy Exchange, and particularly Dean Godson, uh, for commissioning this work and organizing this event. Uh, I'm also very grateful to Professor Eakins, who uh, scrutinized the draft uh, in an immensely helpful way. Um, as you know, he runs the Judicial Powers Project here, which uh, has produced and is producing uh, many studies of different issues arising over the boundaries that uh, can or should be set to judicial power vis-a-vis -vis other elements of governmental power, and it's a very important project. This is just one small contribution to it. And I should also just say that I wasn't given any steer or instruction on what to write. Um, there's no party line here, um, and that also means that any stupidities in what I say are entirely my own. Um, <clears throat> I'm particularly grateful to the three very eminent uh, figures who've agreed to uh, act as commentators here. Um, I'm well aware that between them they have practical and theoretical expertise that goes far, far beyond anything that I can claim to. I am, after all, a bit of an interloper in this field, uh, just trying to give a, a, a sort of fresh view of some uh, aspects of it. Uh, a friend a couple of days ago, having seen the list of who was commenting on this, said, well, you're going to feel like Daniel in the lion's den. <clears throat> but having seen the list of people here, including some very eminent uh, lawyers and judges, I think, no, not Daniel in the lion's den, but Daniel in the entire Serengeti National Park. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I've been asked to speak for 12 minutes, so I have to be brief. And since I can't expect anyone to have read this pamphlet in full already, I'll call it a pamphlet, although it turns out a book length. <clears throat> the most useful thing I can do is just try to summarize the key points. <clears throat> the first part of it, the longest part, the first four chapters, consists of uh, a, a critical account of some key aspects of the body of human rights law that we have 
under the European Convention, so primarily the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg uh, Court of Human Rights. <coughs> I'd like to emphasize at the outset, I'm not concerned with deciding whether the overall effects of this have been good or bad. My personal opinion, and I state this in the pamphlet, is that they have been uh, very good. Um, a huge amount of good has been done by particular judgments to the benefit often of quite vulnerable people. But that's not my concern and not the basis on which I'm judging it. Um, my concern is the methods and principles used in the judgment, how good are those? And what are the implications if one finds that they're not good? And also, to what extent should these matters, all of these matters, be judged in this kind of forum as opposed to some other one? <clears throat> So, just to look very briefly at the way this court works, I think the general public probably assumes that a human rights court engages in some uh, calculus of sort of pure human rights and gives you the result and says, well, this is what the human right is in this case. Well, in a sense, they do do that. But in practice, in almost every case, what they're doing is a rather complicated balancing operation between, so to speak, a pure right on the one hand and all kinds of other things, uh, which may include conflicting rights, but in many cases, interests and policy interests, things like national security, protection of public health and morals and so on. These are things stated in the convention when it gives the so-called limitations, the grounds on which it may be legitimate to interfere with the right or restrict its practice. <clears throat> so it's a complicated business and involves the court in a kind of judgment of policy issues that probably goes beyond what is normally the case in other fields of law. A whole series of methods and principles have evolved in order to deal with that, and I'll look at some of the main ones in these uh, early chapters. There's the famous principle of proportionality, which of course extends beyond just this area of law, but it's particularly prominent in European human rights law. When you look at it in detail, I think almost every commentator sees problems here. The general idea that everything should be proportional, these things should not be disproportionate. We can all agree with that in the abstract. But in detail, you have to ask proportion to what? And how do you measure these proportions when you have conflicting values and interests and rights, uh, sometimes multiple ones, and sometimes relating to goods and values that most people would say are pretty incommensurable? Uh, one can make an effort at uh, not being disproportionate, but the idea that there is some calculus that will give you the right answer and show that this is proportional and that is not turns out to be um, rather problematic. Another principle that has become famous and specific to the court in Strasbourg is the so-called margin of appreciation. This, broadly speaking, is the idea that <clears throat> the court leaves to national governments and national authorities some sort of leeway or discretion in some areas of uh, what has come up for decision. And again, that seems in the abstract a very uh, beneficial and sensible uh, principle. But when you look in detail at the case law and how the margin of appreciation has been described and how it has been applied in this case versus that, it's very, very difficult to see on what rational basis the size and extent of the marginal appreciation is actually calculated. Uh, all sorts of factors are listed, sometimes just in a sort of jumble of factors. There's no attempt to give relative weightings to them. Uh, and the result is that um, quite eminent commentators on this area of law have thrown up their hands and said, well, we, we cannot see what the system is. It seems actually a very subjective uh, way of doing things. <clears throat> One aspect of that which plays a role in deciding whether there's a large margin of appreciation or a, or a narrow one, is the principle, of, so called principle of consensus. In other words, if many countries of the 47 signatory states of the Convention follow a certain practice, for example, in limiting the practice of a right in certain ways, if there's a majority doing that, then that creates a kind of consensus and uh, extends the margin of appreciation in that direction. If it's a small minority, the opposite happens. But again, when academic specialists have looked at the principle of consensus, they've found it very hard to see how it actually operates. You would think here at least we're down to something quite arithmetical out of 47 countries, but in some cases a majority of 51% has been found decisive 
And in other cases, a majority of 79 over 80 percent has been found uh, not decisive at all. <clears throat> so, bringing together mainly uh, the comments and analyses of others, supplemented by my own little forays into some aspects of the case law, I find that there's something quite worrying about the pattern that emerges. These are a lot of the key operating principles at Strasbourg in this kind of law, and they are often inconsistently applied, perhaps inherently incoherent, or lacking the kind of coherence that one might expect. And I'm not the only person to have suggested that there are requirements of a rule of law that are not being properly met here, uh, that the methods of judgment should be predictable and knowable in advance. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be the case where some of these key operating principles are concerned. <clears throat> so that's um, the sort of methods used. I also discussed the question of rights expansion, so-called proliferation or inflation of rights. Um, there is quite a powerful doctrine in the court in Strasbourg that the convention is what is called a living instrument, and that there, even that there is a duty on the court to expand it in substantive ways. Judge Costa, former president of the court, has written recommending that on the basis of a passage in the preamble to the convention, which I think demonstrably does not authorize substantive expansion of the kind that he recommends. And one of the things I do is try to make that demonstration. But on the other hand, I'm not advocating what Americans would call some narrow originalism. Uh, this is a treaty. There are principles of treaty law uh, which allow the meanings to be updated in line with uh, developments both in law and in social and other conditions, and I think that's absolutely right. The meaning of a phrase such as inhumanly degrading treatment will change over time, and I think that's absolutely uh, as it should be. <clears throat> However, when I look at the ways in which expansion has happened, and I attempt an analysis of this with eight different methods listed and briefly described, I find many examples where I think it really does go beyond the legitimate scope of updating the meanings of terms and other uh, things that are found in the text of the convention. <clears throat> Often the expansion is based on an appeal to what are said to be underlying values or overarching values, and you get a kind of so-called teleological interpretation of the text, which may, may on key points, go beyond what is uh, what would be part of a reasonable interpretation of that text. Um, for example, the word home in Article 8, which protects and uh, demands respect for uh, family and private life, private and family life, the home and correspondence. I think the meaning of home now is pretty much the same as it was in 1950 when the convention was written, but the court has decided that it includes business premises and, and offices, and has done so on the basis of an argument about the purpose of Article 8, which I think is in direct contradiction with the actual text of the second part of that article. <clears throat> and then the third point in this uh, first section is about democracy, um, because as, <coughs> excuse me, as rights expand, they may encroach in some of their areas of subject matter on decision-making that should properly be uh, in the province of a democratic legislature. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, an important issue that needs to be thought about seriously, and which brings us rather directly to the aims of the Judicial Power Project. <clears throat> the second part of, the, uh, of this little book is a more theoretical and abstract chapter on the nature of human rights, and here I will summarize very briefly. I criticize what I view as the, the general orthodoxy on this among the theorists, which is that to understand human rights, or at least to show sort of how they arise, we must start in the realm of moral philosophy and find essential values and norms, uh, and then find a sort of special subset of those which are so important that they generate these special rights that have to be enshrined in law. And I believe, and I try to show, that starting off in the realm of moral philosophy like that leads you into various problems. I think this is a mistake, and the place to start is actually in political theory. Uh, and that this, taking this approach, solves a number of theoretical problems and may indeed have implications for practice. And I will just very briefly mention one aspect of that, the aspect that I think is the most um, easy to, uh, to grasp hold of for those who just use the 
the concept of human rights as it is generally used. In the moral philosophy view of the right, then human rights would be the most important things pertaining to relations between all individuals, between me and every other person in this room and so on. And the fact that they also involve governments would be some secondary phenomenon. But we all know that human rights are invoked vis-a-vis -vis states and the use of state power. Uh, my argument is that they are statements about the limits to state power and the point at which the abuse of state power begins to jeopardize the actual legitimacy of the state. So they're about the legitimacy of uh, state power. When your car is stolen, you don't say you've suffered a human rights violation, although Article 1 of uh, Protocol 1 is on the peaceful enjoyment of your possessions. But if a government agency confiscates your car without explanation, without uh, any due course, and without compensation, you might start talking about human rights. The third and final part is the what is to be done part. Um, and here, I have to confess, this is the bit that I'm most diffident about. Now, of course, the exchange is a think tank, and they kindly asked me to write this, and I thought it would be odd not to end up with some sort of policy implications. Um, but perhaps the meat of what I've tried to do is in the first two parts, and this is the bit that I would happily make concessions on if someone came up with a better idea. But with regret, I have concluded, given the arguments I've laid out, especially in the early part of this pamphlet, that it's not possible uh, to stay in the convention. Um, some people have suggested that we can finesse this by telling our own Supreme Court to adopt uh, a, a stricter interpretation of the actual text of the convention. I don't see how that would work. Uh, in the long term, you would end up with two different kinds of human rights law based on the same document, and we would still be subject under international law uh, to the Strasbourg Court, and under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the fact that we have acquiesced in the interpretations of that court over many, many years establishes an absolute fatal quantity that we cannot and should not wriggle out of while pretending that we're still bound by that multilateral treaty or convention. So with reluctance, knowing that this is psychologically a very unwelcome recommendation, I suggest that we should leave the convention. We should set up our own human rights regime. Uh, to do so is not in itself extremist or nationalistic or xenophobic or any of the other things. There are plenty of responsible democracies that do this, and um, I see nothing wrong in principle with it. I suggest making some, some adjustments to the way that that uh, new charter or bill of rights would be drawn up in the light of my own theoretical claims. I would like it to be more stated as prohibitions on state the misuse of state power, and perhaps more detailed in setting up what kinds of misuse would be covered by it. But at the same time, I suggest that it would be a good idea as a separate exercise for the government to issue what I call a code of protected rights. And this would be a huge encyclopedic document, not a new promulgation of code in any sense, but just gathering together existing law in the wording that it has, plus generally agreed common law principles and so on, just to show that people are covered by a huge panoply of rights in our legal system. Um, children, prisoners, women, trade unionists, whatever. Um, and this is partly because it would be good for citizens just to be able to see this and be able to look it up online and search in it, but also psychologically, I think, because of the inevitable reaction if one changes uh, the human rights regime and introduces a new charter that might in some ways be narrower than the previous uh, apparent rules of the convention, good psychologically to show, no, we're not taking away your rights because the things we worry about in almost every case are already covered by a panoply of human rights that surrounds them. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to say thank you very much for inviting me to read what's an engaging and I think an important uh, account of matters. And I agree very much with Noel Malcolm's diagnosis that human rights standards matter, uh, but that there is a crisis. Um, and I think part of it is due to proliferation of rights and proliferation of rights documents. Um, and uh, it's partly due to questions about interpretation. And I'm not going to comment on that because philosophers have rather a different set of worries about interpretation from those that agitate lawyers. 
and uh, let me how I did get the sphere from Richard to not interpretation. So I'll talk about justification. Uh, now, uh, I think your central proposition is that justification should be sought not in moral philosophy but in political theory. Um, and uh, specifically that it makes sense to see human rights as articulating limits on the proper use of state power. Um, I agree that this has merits in that we uh, don't want, as people often do, to end up classifying lots of violations of criminal or other law as human rights violations and that it, it um, as it were, cuts the vocabulary down from uh, that uh, way of extending it. But what I'm very unsure about is the suggestion that the justification should lie in the necessary conditions for democracy. Um, I think that thought has been very much developed by a number <coughs> of leading political philosophers in the post-war period. And um, uh, Mills, Habermas, Amartya Sen, uh, and each of them has sought to anchor not specifically human rights, but their account of justice in, in an extensive or expansive way, an account of agreement under certain conditions that are, broadly speaking, conditions for democracy. I fear that this approach to justification may be circular. That's to say, as I see it, democracy might be the fourth most important characteristic of a political system. Um, um, uh, it presupposes, I would think, order, the rule of law, and uh, probably the elementary rights of the person. And if you have democracy without each of those, uh, it's quite questionable. You have only to think about Plato's account of democracy in the Republic uh, to see uh, that the, uh, the thought that democracy is uh, mob rule, demagoguery, uh, which is most unwelcome, arises from the fact that Plato is thinking about democracy without its preconditions, without the rule of law, without even order, uh, without the elementary rights of the person. So I'm quite sceptical, in spite of its being quite popular among philosophers, of the idea that we start with democracy. Um, now, uh, that, that idealizes is probably pretty unwelcome. Uh, but I do agree with a lot of the other bits of diagnosis. Let me then say what alternative I see um, up to a point. Uh, I think that we can take um, a historical view here. And I really apologize. I've just seen what everyone else has seen. Um, how did we get in this mess? Um, if you would. Uh, be discussing these topics. Through many past centuries in Europe, people would have talked not about rights but about duties. And they would have distinguished perfect and imperfect duties, various ways of drawing the distinction. But broadly speaking, most of the perfect duties might be thought of as matters of justice, and the imperfect duties have often been seen as matters of virtue or of ethics. And to me, a very interesting question is, how did we reverse the question? How did we come to get rid of the classical question, what ought we do, and substitute the rather ignoble question, what ought we get to, which is essentially the recipient's perspective? I think if you want a quick sketch of how I think it may have happened, duty ended up in very ill repute in the wake of the First War because of the exaggerated views on patriotic duty uh, because of the, uh, in the 30s, one sees it in many writers, poets and novelists, as well as others. And um, we then get logical positivism trying to overdo the whole shebang by saying that about ethics and, of course, with, with it, uh, accounts of justice, uh, aesthetics, metaphysics, theology are literally meaningless. Very bad arguments, but very influential. And then we get, in a post-war period, a rather a delayed reaction, the claim that political philosophy is dead. Uh, and then, hence, the revival of political philosophy, the Mills, the Habermas, 
saying in very many of his writers' letters. Um, what I think this shows is that uh, the human rights at, uh, as they emerged in the Universal Declaration and the European Convention were a very restrained and limited attempt to uh, make good on what had been lost in a fuller, wider account of justice and ethics that uh, took action more seriously. And the real sign of this to me is that um, people find it perfectly acceptable to talk about rights without being able to talk about action or the agents, who ought to do what for whom, is surely the basic question here. And it disappears when you just talk about who to claim what. Uh, needless to say, claims don't work if they're not directed to an affected agent. So we get two, I think, constant problems with the human rights <coughs> perspective. One is about who has the duties. What about the allocation of the duties? Now, people have lots of answers to that, but are they good enough answers? Uh, and I suppose the covenants of 1966 would be an example of a move to put the duties with the state's charter. Complete vacillation on justification. The covenants also aren't actually a solution, because what you get, get is not an allocation of the duties that are the counterparts to human rights, but unfortunately, a claim that the states ought to bring it about that there is somebody or some institution, a competent person or institution that has the duties. If the justification is short, is there made politically in a way, but at very high cost? So I better be, go off the high ball now and say that I do think we could do better by way of justification. Um, and uh, to my mind, good justifications use limited but available premises. And a great deal of the difficulty of what's gone on these last 50 years is people <coughs> being keen to use very extensive assumptions, uh, which are, are difficult to, uh, uh, as it were, justify for the very reasons that human rights are difficult to justify. That's why I think justifying it by appealing to democracy or to the states doesn't work or, or, or positive law doesn't work or choice, which philosophers do quite a lot, or interests. So I think probably the right way to go if you're interested in justification. I realize lots of people aren't, but if you are, um, it might be to go um, be much more astringent and much more minimalist about the assumptions that you permit yourself in justifying human rights. Now, I'm afraid I'm known, known for being a card carrying cat and under a minimalist interpretation. Uh, but I think what might be interesting is to look at the necessary conditions for the possibility of communication and reject any principles that don't meet them. For example, reject a principle of coercion you cannot recommend coercion to everybody. If others adopted it, they, uh, you could, uh, they could not, um, uh, some people could not be coerced. Ditto deception. So that there is a way to justify a political order that I think meets these astringent conditions. And I think it would incorporate quite a lot of what we recognize and find important in human rights, but without being, uh, let's say, miserly, parsimonious, and inadequate on questions of justification. Thank you. <laughs> There's very little time to comment on what is an extremely interesting and thought-provoking book. Um, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a pragmatist, mm -hmm. um, and And um, my starting point is to consider <coughs> the purpose of the Convention. When you read the human rights of the Convention, they are very significant rights indeed. They're not just the result of consensus. Uh, they are rights that you need, to, by and large, to make life worth living. And if you don't have those rights, they can make life really miserable. And so, basically, they're rights which should be preserved by the state areas where the state should not encroach. And Germany encroached hideously on these fundamental rights. And the 
convention uh, was bred from those abuses. And the intention was that all the states of Europe should get together and in future act really to police individual states in the way that they behave to their own subjects. My view, and Strasbourg hasn't followed this, is that the basic agreement uh, that was reached in the convention uh, related to how each individual state should treat those within its own territory. And that's a quite extraordinary kind of convention. Conventions usually deal with the way states are going to act in relation to each other or join together to meet a common interest. So the specific object of this was that there should be um, a union of uh, European states policing the actions of each one towards their own subjects. How is the policing to be done? It be done through the medium of a court which would represent all of the states. Now that court, it seems to me, is given an almost impossible task. Very general rights. Um, and it had to work out in individual cases what these meant on the ground. Now, I don't know how many cases went before the court which were really serious invasions of human rights. We didn't have those kinds of invasions in this country. Uh, we've been concerned with much more peripheral questions. But before we say, let's pull out of the European Convention on Human Rights, it seems to me one's got to stand back and see whether the object of this convention has actually been effected. To what extent has the peer pressure of judgments in the European Court affected the way individual member states have been treating its citizens? And particularly member states uh, who uh, do not have our tradition of respect for individual rights. Um, many of the criticisms of the jurisprudence um, of Strasbourg, I think, are well founded. I have further very significant criticisms with which you don't have, which is the way the Strasbourg Court has actually expanded the ambit of operation of the Convention beyond looking at how people treat <coughs> their own citizens to how they behave anywhere in the world. Um, there's been a, a quite remarkable expansion of the concept of the jurisdiction uh, of individual uh, states and of the Strasbourg Court in relation to human rights violations. And that has caused enormous practical difficulties and was not something that the member states had ever agreed to. And originally, the Strasbourg Court had said, in which this is not an area where we can apply um, the living instrument theory. This is what the states agreed to, and we should respect it. They have abandoned that, and I think it should be pretty fair for that. But even so, ultimately, I think one needs a really careful analysis of whether overall the Strasbourg Court is still doing a good job in Europe as a whole in protecting human rights. And if it is, we shouldn't leave it, because if we do leave it, I think we'll probably destroy it. Others will pull out as well, following our example, uh, justifying their action from our example, and they're likely to be the states for whom one has, or in respect of which one has the greatest concern as to the way uh, they may uh, treat their own citizens. Thank you. Well, um, before I turn to Chris first, I might just point out a little bit that um, uh, our very first paper in the Digital Power Project was a pretty stringent criticism of the Strasbourg Court for its, uh, its departure from Bankovic. So I'd yeah. like to hear those two words uh, echo. Participants. Well, <coughs> so no book gives us an unrivaled, though, as Lord Phillips has just observed, still incomplete explanatory <coughs> checklist of the ways in which the European Court of Human Rights has steadily expanded the power of judges. The power of judges to declare that the laws adopted now, uh, as Lord Phillips says, sometimes adopted in a way less than mature democracy, but also as uh, General Duncan's uh, book emphasizes uh, laws adopted in civilized and mature democracies like ours, the power of judges to declare that such laws violate a right or rights which any human being morally has and which those democracies committed themselves to in the 1950s, committed themselves to uphold and respect 
a declaration of a kind that each time it is made in the name of law ought to shock the citizens and other government authorities of that democracy and shame them into a reform, if not overthrowing the regime that has instituted this immoral abuse of power and this violation of the nation's treaty undertaking. In fact, of course, such judicial de declarations are widely and rightly, rightly regarded with irritation and cynicism because in truth and reality, given the court's unrelenting assumption of what amounts to legislative and policy-making power, each such declaration, at least in its first precedent-setting instance, in fact represents a highly artificial way of formulating one side of a more or less uh, of, a, of a more or less routine disagreement, a kind of routine disagreement about social and political policy of a kind that a disagreement of a kind that in more mature uh, self-respecting democracies such as the English Republic, I think we were before we uh, adopted this convention and doubled down on the Human Rights Act or as uh, Australia still remains a democracy which reserves these discussions, these very same discussions, to legislative, legislative and electoral discourse, debate, resolution. Debate and resolution which makes countless appeals to rights, rights and wrongs, human rights, civil rights, and so forth, but is not conducted by judges. The courts, such a court's declaration, artificially frames its resolution of the disagreement resolution that is reached by a majority voting in what amounts to a legislative policy chamber of five or seven or nine or at most 21 people. It's framing this as an application of the law to which the whole polity committed itself as essential to respecting the very dignity of any given person. These artificial declarations are often received, as I said, with cynicism and, and so on, which is not unwarranted but also in a way, curiously, with too much respect by non-lawyer members of parliament and government who seem to have only a hazy idea of the difference between human rights litigation, in its leading decisions at least, and genuine interpretation and application of law. And this book should help these politically responsible non-lawyer persons and the wider politically responsible electorate to see through the artificiality to the assumption of legislative and policy-making authority, in the case of the European Court of Human Rights, I think a usurpation, which the acquiescence of many in these circles and the complicity of others, for example, those who enacted the Human Rights Act in 1998, have gone a long way in effectively to ratifying and legitimating. Well, I, I called the, the book partly a checklist, and chapter four is a checklist of, of uh, ways in which the court has uh, expanded and it's a, it's an admirable list i won't go through it um, to those you, you can add the earlier analyses of the book of the conventions inherent ambiguities ambiguities about whether its rights are those stated in you can say take any one of its articles the first limb or only those when they're taken together with and specified by laws and rights and interests envisaged by the article second limb and then the hopeless ambiguity of necessary in a democratic society and the dazzling but baseless judicial substitute for necessary namely proportion well i'm on record as taking um, as i already have today a good deal more gloomy a view than, than the than i think of the correctness or rather <coughs> incorrectness and illegitimacy of the court's decisions I don't think any of the court's many, many adverse judgments on the laws and settled policies of the United Kingdom have been correct as applications of the convention. In some cases, I would have voted against the law or policy or for its repeal or reform, but that I think is not relevant to the question whether the right held by the court to have been violated was indeed a right to which the United Kingdom committed itself as a signatory of the convention and which is protected by the Convention because any human being is morally entitled to it. So I have reservations about the book's proposal, but having withdrawn from the Convention, 
as we should for the sake of the rule of law and democratic self-determination, we should replace it with a bill or a charter of human rights for the United Kingdom that would, I suppose, as far as I can tell, be justiciable in the courts. Whether the upshot of such litigation would be a mere declaration of incompatibility, as has been bid to envisage in part, or a striking down of even an act of law, parliamentary law, by the Supreme Court, as has been more tentatively envisaged, uh, I think, uh, and, and indeed, however minimal the scope of the Charter in its restriction to specific prohibitions on the government and all its public and commercial and forms of oppression and tyranny, with all of these, um, uh, I, I think, in relation to all of them, I think the preferable solution would be simply to revert to the position taken by our Constitution at the earliest times, in which Parliament is trusted to legislate without oppression and tyranny, and the courts apply the laws enacted by Parliament, interpreted with some favour for the established rights of citizens, and in the last analysis in line with the intention. Nor finally do I have much enthusiasm for the book's proposal to supplement its minimalist but justiciable charter of rights and human rights with a code of protected rights taken from existing UK law. This is a, a minor proposal, and perhaps it will be useful. The experiment of, of stating all our law in terms of rights was made by another fellow of all souls uh, in the mid 18th century using a template drawn up in the mid 17th century. It was Chief Justice Sir Matthew Hale's template and Professor Sir William Blackstone's experiment, his masterly commentaries on the laws of England, all the compilers passed from from beginning to end in terms of rights, a sort of force. But for all its brilliance, it's artificial, because as uh, Baroness O'Neill has said, the law is for the sake of justice, and justice always involves two sides, the side of the person responsible for acting justly, and the side of the person with the right that the former so act. We all occupy both positions bearers of rights and duties encompassed by kinds of conflict as defined by civilized rules of law adopted with an eye to the general principle of justice. And unlike Sonol, I think that philosophically these principles do go all the way down and that a few of them scarcely need from rules of law more than republication and enforcement. These are our, and I will say it, human rights not to be raped, murdered, plundered, lied to, cuckolded, kidnapped, enslaved, coercively prostituted, and so forth. And I, of course, agree with this historical sociological observation that the term human rights, as deployed in discourse in the mid 20th century, the discourse that we've lived with as it's crystallized into the human rights institutions and industries today, is largely focused on my right not to be treated in any of those ways by governments be protected by governments against such treatment as anyone else can. I think, however, that there is more continuity between the present specialized artificial discourse of human rights and the historic philosophical judgments that lawyers and educated people generally were, were willing to articulate in terms of rights, natural rights, common to all persons and peoples, even in the second century of our era when Gaius and Alpha were talking about the naturality of the world. Well, thank you very much. My instructions for this part of the discussion were to be even briefer. Um, <clears throat> so I know we have to end at 7.30. And um, there is much to think about there. So forgive me if I'm very um, sort of summary and schematic and indeed selective in what I very quickly try to respond to. Um, to Lord Phillips, I would say, yes, I, I absolutely agree the uh, experience of the Second World War and of um, Nazi and fascist and indeed in the background other totalitarian crimes was, was absolutely essential. And I think this strengthens my sense of the state-directed nature of these modern human rights uh, instruments. Has it put pressure on other member states over the last 60 odd years? I think the answer is clearly yes. Um, I have interests in particularly uh, some Southeast European countries and I've seen the pressure that it's exerted there and I regard that as a good thing. But as I said at the beginning, my task here I thought was not just to engage in some consequentialist judgment of good or bad results, but to look at the intrinsic nature of what 
was done. And on those aspects, um, well, Professor Finnis has put it more trenchantly and <laughs> with uh, um, greater strength than, than I could have done myself. Um, would it be disastrous because others might take our leaving as a pretext for leaving themselves? On the whole, countries that want to leave will leave. Uh, I don't believe that Mr. Putin, for example, will depend on the decisions of any other country, and indeed Russia's own disagreements with the court predate our um, spat with it over Putin's rights uh, on quite separate issues. Uh, but in the end, what can I say? I believe if I were Prime Minister and you know, a senior minister looking at these matters, I would feel that my duty was to do what was best for this country. Um, I would certainly consider effects on other countries, but I would consider my responsibilities as an elected politician of this country. The issues raised by uh, Lady O'Neill and Professor Finnis um, are, on the theoretical side, are complex. I can't do justice to them now, but just very, very briefly. To Lady O'Neill, I would say, I'm not just reducing all the justification to a matter of democracy, to what is democratic or not. When I say that these rights are, they belong to political theory, um, part of what I'm saying is that they don't need to be defended in a foundational way. It is a fact that populations in uh, a modern state, and I'm talking particularly about what I call democracies or would-be democracies, in other words, modern states that are democratic or where people would like to be more democratic, even if that's not what they're getting. It is a fact that they have a pretty clear set of fundamental things that they require of a state, such that if it doesn't do it or if it does the opposite, they will not regard that state power as legitimate. Um, we, as theorists of human rights, don't, don't need to demonstrate the value of those things from the foundations through moral theory. We can take them as given. In that sense, my way of putting it is non-foundational. It is just a political fact that people do not want the state to kill them, torture them, and so on. But there are other facts that may change gradually over time. They might want a basic framework of welfare and regard that as essential in a way that 100 years ago people didn't. So by being non-foundational, I can also put in a little element of cultural relativism, which is often a problem for some of the traditional theories. Now, why do they not want these terrible things to happen to them? They will have their own reasons, which relate directly to whatever are the most important moral values that they have, and perhaps other values as well. And they will relate to the other things that Lady O'Neill mentioned, the absolute importance of order and rule of law, uh, and rights of the person, if I can translate that into a sort of more general moral language of what matters to them in terms of personal morality. Um, so that's what I mean by uh, saying it's, it's political theory. And the role of democracy is partly that I'm not concerned with applying this to every regime in history. I think it matters uh, to modern regimes, democratic or would be democratic, because human rights are a special kind of, of sort of program of claims on the state. And historically, it's just pointless to go back to you know, the Inca emperors and say, oh, well, they were violating people's human rights. We can certainly say they were uh, violating basic principles of morality when they took people away for human sacrifice. But I don't think it makes sense to talk about a sort of program of claims existing historically then. This, this is also historically dependent to a certain extent. Um, to Professor Finnis, on this last and sort of fundamental point, um, of course, if one just reverts to basic moral values and is determined to run the whole theory from a moral foundation as a, 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 a sort of application of moral philosophy, well, in one sense, one, one can sustain the sort of standard uh, view of moral uh, human rights that, that, that the human rights world works with roughly today. In another sense, one could almost dispense with human rights as a special category and just say, well, these things are morally, morally important things. Law has always dealt with morally important things. What could be more morally important than murder? Uh, but every legal system since the beginning of civilization has had laws dealing with murder. So in a sense, it's a superfluous category and we can dispense with it. 
Um, that doesn't mean that de destroying people's rights, it means that we're just looking at an ordinary legal methods to deal with moral important matters. I can see the logic and simplicity of that. The difference is simply that I, I actually think human rights are a special category because I think, um, as I've said, that they relate in special ways to claims that we have on the state that it should not act in uh, oppressive and tyrannical ways to us. And I think there is a value in preserving that as a special category and sort of focusing uh, law on it to some extent in a special way. Um, as for my supplementary proposal on a code, as I said, I'm diffident about all the practicalities. I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression by doing that that we're converting the whole body of English, existing English law into rights uh, and privileging that side of what is Professor Spinner says we always have another side to it. But just to reassure people who have now been brought up for two or more generations, uh, that they've been brought up to think that some special rights protection is the essential protection that the legal system must give them. Just to reassure them, no, actually there is a lot over there, and it's there all the time in ordinary law. Well, we have time for um, uh, a few questions. I did give um, strict directions on timing. Uh, thanks for my um, speakers for following them. So, uh, questions, comments from the floor? Um, to the back, right there. We could um, say who you are briefly, perhaps, and then make a question. Quite short percentage, please. <coughs> Jonathan Hugh um, recently retired from the Ministry of Defence, where I've spent some time working on human rights issues. Um, and I know, Sir Noel, for understandable reasons, in your book you emphasise the question of prisoner voting as the perhaps the main rubbing point. But we in the Ministry of Defence, and I know many others, including Policy Exchange, were very concerned about other aspects of the, uh, the Human Rights Convention which also seems to be coming up with uh, results which, again, most people would not have thought to be optimal. Um, I'm thinking in particular, and Lord Phillips alluded to this, the, the surprising extension of jurisdiction um, outside the, uh, the territory of signatory states, which meant that suddenly military operations in Afghanistan and, and Iraq were found to be within jurisdiction, um, and recognising indeed that um, you know, those were unpopular wars and that there were many bad things that were done which, which would be illegal anyway were it not for the Human Rights Convention. We have found that for what turned out to be largely technical breaches of the right not to be detained arbitrarily, very large sums of money are now being paid to people who had extremely hostile intentions you know, towards British forces who were entitled to defend themselves. So my question is really, assuming that you know, your proposal um, for some different kind of human rights instrument were to come to fruition, would you exclude extraterritorial jurisdiction? And would you uh, alternatively um, exclude um, it operating in any area which is already subject to a code of international law, as military operations, of course, are in the Geneva Conventions? Well, the answer to your First question is, yes, I would exclude it. Um, I can use a bit of time to think about the second, but, but, but um, if the, the, the thrust of that is again to deal with people extraterritorially who are not citizens of, of this country and not really subject to its laws, then I'd be inclined to say yes to your second question. Um, on the uh, the problems you referred to, I didn't talk about them at all in what I wrote, um, mainly because, as Professor Eaton said, uh, there was an excellent and detailed report on that uh, done here by um, Tom Tugendhat and, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, uh, and so the issue of what became known as lawfare um, uh, has been given a good area. I mean, as you know, it starts with a certain ambiguity in the wording of the Convention uh, about securing these rights to those under the state's jurisdiction. Um, but I think uh, I mean, my sympathies are with the report and the analysis of the um, Lord Phillips can, I'm sure, speak more authoritatively on this than I can because um, I haven't gone into the details of those issues. Well, <coughs> I think I made my complaint that um, <coughs> Strasbourg ought to have had regard to um, the fact that its uh, its activities were essentially consensual when the convention was concluded. 
and shouldn't have gone outside the general consensus to what it should be doing. Thank you. Um, Matt, where next? Can I ask to my question? Charles, Charles Moore for the, from the Telegraph. Um, really directed to Lord Phillips. Uh, Lord Phillips made a very interesting description of what he thought the court was doing, which was policing. Uh, and, and he spoke of um, the rights you need to make life worth living, was the phrase. If, if it is a matter of policing, what does he think of the quality of the police force? Um, in other words, uh, is, it, is Britain not capable of um, ensuring that the rights you need to make life worth living, uh, can, can we not ensure them ourselves with our own judges? What do the police force that he speaks about add yeah. to anything that we may have? So far as this country is concerned, I entirely agree. We could do the job extremely well ourselves with our Supreme Court. Um, I do think if the Supreme Court had been doing the job with this particular um, uh, series of uh, um, very general human rights, we would have seen a similar expansion and development of what was covered in the judgments um, of the court, ultimately. Um, courts almost inevitably expand the area of the law that they're dealing with. Just look at the way the common law has developed the law of negligence, from initially physical injury, and then extending it wider and wider and wider. So if it had been uh, our own responsibility uh, to make rulings on this particular code, uh, I think uh, there might be room for criticism as well. But the Daily Mail would certainly be talking about unelected judges taking positions that are really hard. We've got only a little time left, so we might take two or three questions together, and there are three hands up, so uh, you three are right. So we can make your questions very brief indeed. Please let me help, and we'll let the panel handle all three in some combination. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Robert Craig from the LSE Law Department. Um, I want to thank the speakers for making some comments. The question I had was, there's already an example, I'm sorry to pick on the bit that you're most difficult about, um, somehow, but uh, the, the code that you mentioned, there's already an example, I think, which is the ministerial code, which is already over-regulating the political space you could argue. And so the risk that you, you, you have if you get down that ministerial code, as you suggest, is you create um, this, this dynamic, this, this, it has a, a life of its own, which, uh, which over-regulates what is supposed to be a political space. So now you, uh, John Holbrook. So Neil, uh, Noel, you said that human rights are a special category and you gave the example of how the state shouldn't kill people. Um, but there's a real problem there, isn't there, which is how on earth do you define the special category? Because the state, for example, does have a right to kill people. Uh, some mature democracies believe in capital punishment. Um, all democracies believe in the right of self-defense and the right to wage war and so on and so forth. So I don't think you're in a position to carve out any sort of right and say it's so special that it should be protected. Uh, I think the problem with human rights is that they fund the people who believe in human rights fundamentally don't trust the people to defend these rights, to decide these rights. Human rights are fundamentally about taking political issues away from the people and giving them to judges. Uh, and it, it, Question it, finish, John. Okay, so if you want to defend human rights, you ought to say, and I don't put you on the spot here now, I think this is aimed at uh, some others, you ought to say why you do not believe in democracy. And the last question, uh, this is three this one, just over here on my right. John Dover, thank you very much. So putting to one side my concern that um, politicians here of a nationalist bent will very simplistically take uh, some of the conclusions uh, to reinforce our arguments about which one can really do nothing. Uh, my question is, uh, because you've already said that in your opinion regarding uh, former Yugoslavia, the Convention has been useful. Without it, how do you think pressure could usefully be brought on such states regarding their behavior? Does Carl want to lead us off? And I'll pass to the other panelists to take that thoughts on that as well. Well, the first question <coughs> on the ministerial code. Um, I'm afraid I'm not au fait with exactly how this code was put together. and. Um, the, the, the code that I'm talking about would be simply an encyclopedic uh, presentation of what is in existing laws, nothing more than that. Um, and 
uh, I, I, I would be surprised if just the fact of doing that created uh, what you call a, a dynamic for over-regulation. Uh, every right to christen it would just be something that is already there, and it would use the existing wording of the laws that we have. Um, on the second question, the state shouldn't kill people, that some states have capital punishment, and indeed, um, armies can kill people under certain conditions. Well, yes, I, I, I wasn't suggesting that human rights would be stated in such terms that you know, even um, shooting dead a, you know, a, an agent of the state, i.e. a policeman shooting dead a terrorist in the act of committing a terrorist offence would, would, would be a, a violation of human rights. Um, I think it is possible to build in the necessary basic qualifications while adhering to what I think is the fundamental point, which is a statement of uh, what would count as abuses of power by the state so great that they would uh, shake the legitimacy of state power itself. Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, you say what the question of human rights advocates have to answer is why do you not believe in democracy? But the, the whole structure of my argument is designed to get human rights as functioning as I think they should do, as a protection for democracy, uh, which is what is claimed in the rhetoric of Strasbourg judges at the moment, rather selectively. Um, but I believe that as they were set up after the Second World War, in order to um, act against totalitarian uh, states and so on, this is actually um, part of their mission, to protect the kind of democracy that we do want to live in. Um, and on the last question, um, I said that I thought it had been a beneficial influence um, in the case of many countries, not just Southeast, but uh, as I happen to know about. Um, and the question, if I understood it, was sort of what, what, how would that work if we hadn't had the convention? Well, I'm not trying to go back and do counterfactual history. I'm just saying that given the analysis I've made and the conclusions I've come to, I think it's necessary for us now to read the convention. Uh, but I'm sure the convention will continue. I don't believe that our leaving would, would destroy it. Um, it's, it's a mighty engine, and it has, we still have 46 signatory states, um, and it has a great body of law that will continue, no doubt, uh, to grow. Uh, just on the final point, just picking up something that said earlier, that all bodies of law grow. Well, of course, that's generally true, and if we had our own uh, judges doing this kind of human rights law, that would of course have been good. What I've tried to suggest, though only very uh, briefly, is that one could write a, an actual Bill of Rights, Charter of Rights, in a way that would be less conducive to this open-ended expansion than the one that we currently operate under. My suggestion is that it should be phrased in terms of specific prohibitions on the state. For a start, that would make a big difference. You look at the jurisprudence on Article 8, all sorts of things about private life, um, governing now the conduct of paparazzi taking photographs of people who may or may not be standing in public spaces. That sort of thing would fall away. Uh, one would be looking at pre precise, where possible, precise prohibitions on uh, abuses of state power. And I say precise, of course, they've got to be stated in general terms. Uh, but instead of just saying there is a right to a fair trial, one might try to outline the categories of state action that would count as infringing a fair trial. Uh, not an easy task, and I'm no draftsman myself, and I'm not putting my foot so forward. But just given the, 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 the sort of large-scale argument that I set out when I try to analyze the, the very nature of human rights, on top of the criticisms that I've made of things that seem incoherent and inconsistent in the actual system we have, I've tried to suggest, just in outline, some ways of making it better. And so, what's that got five minutes to make I mean, I think it's, it's a very interesting thing to have placed drafting as a set of prohibitions on the exercise of state power. But I think when you reach in there, uh, it's actually very difficult to say what those prohibitions have to be. One can say, put one's hands on the ones that are really um, sort of close in, like more arbitrary uh, murder or torture and so on. Uh, 
but the question is where would you start? How far would it go? Is this not automatically very expensive? Of course, I prefer it because it is focused on uh, action on what ought to be done and what ought not to be done, which I think is much clearer than focusing on rights. But uh, uh, I have my doubts about the clarity of the boundary line. Questions? I don't think we need to do anything except get out and, and, <laughs> and reveal the human rights act. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid I'm, I'm at the slice of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure to ask you to join in thanking our uh, distinguished panel and uh, <laughs>